also a member of uh, a little group of sort of slightly dissident psychiatrists called the Critical Psychiatry Network. So in case any of you are not clear, I am not giving you a mainstream view about psychiatric drug treatment. Um, although there are plenty of psychiatrists who would agree with at least some of what I say. A little introduction about what's been happening recently with psychiatric drug treatment. And one of the most noticeable things, if you look at the statistics, is that we are using more and more drugs for mental health problems. At least more and more drugs are being prescribed for mental health problems um, over about the last 20 years. So the number of antidepressant prescriptions that are issued um, in general practice has gone up four times since the early 90s, 400%. The amount of antipsychotics being prescribed, and this data is just from general practice, so it excludes everyone, all the prescriptions that are issued in hospital, um, has gone up 67%, so two thirds. And these increases are not compensated for by a decline in the use of other drugs like Valium or the benzodiazepines, which I thought they might be when I started looking at this data. In fact, the use of those sorts of drugs, benzodiazepines, have stayed about the same, but the use of, of drugs like antipsychotics and antidepressants and mood stabilizers, inverted commas, has gone up. And these increases have been achieved at least partly by the promotion of this idea that what the drugs are doing is, balance, is, is um, rectifying chemical imbalances correcting an underlying abnormality, an underlying chemical imbalance. So the, this is a quote from Pfizer's website and this picture of the woman in the very balanced position, just to emphasise it. And this is an idea, the idea that the drugs are correcting something, that makes it sound like they must be a good thing, doesn't it? And what I am suggesting is that it hides their real nature and, and all the bad things they can do. And I think this quote really sums, up, sums that up well. Antipsychotic medicines are believed to work by balancing the chemicals found naturally in the brain. Okay, so they're all nice and natural. That's the implication of that quote from Eli Lilly's Zyprexa website. The sort of promotion of antidepressants says the same thing. People with depression may have an imbalance of bra the brain's neurotransmitters and the, the drugs help to balance them out. Now, drugs have been used for mental health problems for a long time. Um, prescription drugs have been very popular for, for at least the whole of the 20th century. And before that, of course, people used psychoactive substances to alter their moods and change their behaviour. Um, off-label and informally, including things like alcohol and later opium. But drugs, that, uh, up until the 1950s and 1960s, drugs that were used in this way were not seen as rectifying a chemical imbalance. Even the drugs that were prescribed for mental health problems were generally seen as uppers or downers, sedatives or stimulants. Um, and lots of drugs were being prescribed, as I say, um, prior to the, the modern period. So when the amphetamines came in in, in the 1940s, they were advertised as pet pills. They would make you smarter and sassier. When the barbiturates came in, they were advertised as sedatives, as downers, as things that would send you to sleep. And this was because until about the mid-20th century, no one thought there was much that could really be done for mental health problems. Um, but that all changed from the 1940s with the introduction of these heroic procedures into psychiatry, which some of, some of you may have heard of, you all will have heard of, because one of them, of course, was ECT. Um, another one which came in in the 1940s was insulin coma therapy. And, of course, there was lobotomy and, and other techniques. And some of these procedures, particularly insulin coma therapy and ECT, came to be thought of as acting in a specific way on the underlying disease, in a way that no previous widely accepted treatment had done before. Of course, most of these procedures, particularly insulin coma therapy, were since found to be completely useless, as well as being very dangerous. It had a death rate of about 10%. So by the time modern drugs arrived in the early 1950s, the point is that psychiatry already believed it had some 
specific treatments, some treatments that were actually treating the disease in some way. When the drugs, when modern drugs first came in, the first one that was introduced was the first drug we still use, was called was um, chlorpromazine, largactil, thorazine, I'm sure you, you will have heard of it. They were very popular and their use spread rapidly throughout the old mental hospitals in Europe and America, helped in America by a massive um, pharmaceutical company aided promotion campaign which included the chief executive of the company going on national primetime television to announce this great medical breakthrough. But Despite the fact that they were very popular, they were not at first seen as acting in a specific or targeted way, in the way that they are now being promoted um, as acting. So the first two psychiatrists who used chlorpromazine were called Delay and Deneker, Jean Delay, Pierre Deneker, who were both working in Paris. And they believed that chlorpromazine and other early antipsychotics were essentially special sorts of sedative, different from the sedatives they'd had before, but, but sedatives, things that worked on the nervous system to suppress or dampen it in some way. That view changed gradually over the course of the 1950s and 1960s and was replaced by the idea that the drugs did some, targeted an underlying disease, did something special and specific, reversed an underlying abnormality. So these are just quotes from textbooks that il illustrate that transformation. And you can see the transformation in adverts as well, really, really nicely. So this is an early advert for the um, old antipsychotic Melaril, emphasising its tranquilizing properties, making it sound very nice, uh, of course, with a nice lake. Lots of adverts advertised these drugs for all sorts of conditions. Um, so they were advertised for anxiety, they were advertised for behaviour problems in children, they were widely promoted at this time for um, agitation and aggression in elderly people, what they've been used for and criticised for being used for recently, of course. Uh, one, one advert, not this one, another one actually, um, advertises them for all the family. You can give them to your children with behaviour problems, your uh, your. Um, elderly relatives who are very agitated and you're going to be so stressed with all these um, you know, badly behaved children and agitated parents that you'll need some yourself as well. It's <laughs> one for the elderly relatives. By 1970, this is an advert for, 19, for Melaril in 1970, that's all changed and it's now being advertised as targeting specific symptoms of psychosis and schizophrenia. And you get the same sort of story with antidepressants. The first drugs that were called antidepressants were essentially stimulant-type drugs, drugs that were used to treat TB that had stimulant effects and were known to send people psychotic, uh, incidentally. Um, so quite similar to amphetamines. And, and first of all, they were described as stimulants, but gradually they started to be distinguished from stimulants and to be called antidepressants and to be claimed to be doing something specific uh, in the condition of depression. So what, what is happening over the course of the 1950s is this change in the way that drugs are con conceptualised. So before the 1950s, drugs are understood and classified and named according to the sort of effects they induce. And they were just very, because no one was terribly interested in drugs at that time, they were just very broadly categorised into either sedatives or stimulants. After the 1950s, drugs come to be classified according to the disease they are thought to treat. And you can see this change in the way things are named. So before the 1950s, sedative stimulants, as far as any classification goes, after the 1950s, things come to be called antipsychotics, antidepressants. And this illustrates two different ways of thinking about what psychiatric drugs might be doing that I've been trying to highlight because I think these what's happened is that the way that um, drugs are thought to work is, is an assumption that's now just sort of buried and hidden and there isn't any discussion about it. So the modern way of thinking is what I've called the disease-centred model, and this is the idea that drugs are acting on an underlying disease or some sort of abnormality that's leading to the symptoms. So it's the idea that they're correcting or reversing an underlying problem. <coughs> 
And this is a model that's based on the way that most drugs can be said to act in general medicine. Um, so, for example, you know, the, the example of insulin in diabetes. If you give someone who's got diabetes insulin, you're helping to reverse the insulin deficiency and you're making, therefore, making the body work more normally. You're not correcting the cause of the diabetes. This is not necessarily a model that says you're treating the ultimate cause of the problem, but you're helping to normalize the situation. Um, in contrast, the, the way that drugs used to be understood as working and the way that I'm suggesting they should be understood as working, the drugs that we currently have at any rate, is what I've called this drug-centered model. And this is the idea that far from normalizing the body or the brain, the drugs that we use actually create an abnormal or an altered state. They are mind and body altering substances. That, of course, is what a drug is. But, the, but psychiatric drugs are mind-altering. That's the really important property that they have. They are an example of a psychoactive substance. Psychoactive substances, of course, also include recreational drugs like alcohol, um, nicotine. And what this model is saying is that the useful effects that psychi psychiatric drug treatment can sometimes have are a consequence of this altered state that they produce. So what happened over the course of the 1950s is that thinking changed from a drug-centered model to a disease-centered model. The important point is that this change did not happen because a whole load of studies were done which proved that what drugs were really doing was reversing underlying diseases or abnormalities or in chemical imbalances. There wasn't any, there was no scientific research set up then, and there's almost no scientific research now to demonstrate that the disease centered model is the correct way of thinking. There wasn't even any debate or discussion. The disease centered model simply took over, um, and the other way of thinking about how drugs might work, the drug centered way, was just forgotten. I think this change occurred because people wanted it to, to occur, because psychiatrists wanted it to occur, because they desperately wanted to have, to be able to offer real medical treatments that made a real difference um, to, a, a, to, to what they were suggesting was an underlying disease process. It also happened because it was politically expedient. The idea that there were drug treatments that could cure people was, was very helpful um, to politicians who wanted to empty out and close down the old asylums um, and to, uh, to pretend that issues that were raised by mental disturbance, mental disorders, um, had been solved. So what, what might constitute, I just want to think, think about evidence for a couple of minutes, although I'm not going to go into it in great detail, there's lots of stuff in my book and things on the web that I've written as well, if you want more references. The first point to make is that the vast majority of evidence that is held up to support the idea that psychiatric drugs work does not distinguish how they work, because that evidence is placebo-controlled trials. If you compare a mind-altering substance with a placebo, obviously people are going to feel and behave and act and think differently. So the fact that there are some changes in a mania rating scale or a depression rating scale or a psychosis rating scale or anything else doesn't indicate that that drug has had any fundamental effect on an underlying process. It just indicates that it's got some mind-altering properties. Things that might support a disease-centered model are things like, if, if we knew, like we do in many areas, not all, but many areas of medicine, what, what the underlying pathology was for various mental disorders. The trouble is, of course, we don't. There are lots of claims. There are claims that you know depression is caused by a serotonin imbalance. Um, that schizophrenia is caused by a dopamine imbalance, but the but but these don't stack up. There, there's, there's lots of holes in these theories. Um, they're very inconsistent, and most um, there, there isn't any agreement that, that any of them actually provide a satisfactory explanation. Other evidence might be if 
drugs that were thought to have specific effects were superior to drugs that weren't thought to have spe specific effects. And funnily enough, there's very little evidence, very few studies that have actually tried to show this. And the studies that have just don't, don't show it. So there are a couple of studies comparing lith lithium, for example, with antipsychotics in people with acute psychotic episodes. Neither of those studies showed that whether you got lithium, whether you improved with lithium or whether you improved with antipsychotic was de antipsychotics was determined in any way by the sort of psychosis you had. So if you had a manic type psychosis, you weren't any more likely to respond to lithium than you were to antipsychotics. If you had a more schizophrenic picture, and I should be putting all these terms in inverted commas, I don't want you to think that I subscribe to all these terms. I, I um, think, think there are lots of problems with the terminology, but, but just in order to describe the research, I'm having to use it. Um, if you had a schizophrenic type psychosis, you were not any more likely to respond to the antipsychotics than the, than the lithium. The only difference was that if you were very disturbed, you didn't respond too well to the lithium because it to achieve the same level of, level of sedation, um, everyone got toxic. So, so lithium wasn't terribly good when people were very disturbed. E even a study of people who all had acute mania that compared lithium and antipsychotics didn't find any advantage for, the, for lithium, even though it's long been claimed that lithium is a specific, has an, a specific effect on mood. So what's the alternative? What is this, what is this drug-centered model saying about how psychiatric drugs work? Well, it's saying partly that they have direct, that, that the mind-altering effects of psychiatric drugs have a direct impact on the symptoms of mental disorders, on the sorts of problems and behaviours um, that people show, that people have. Um, there's, there's also the issue that in placebo-controlled trials, some of the difference, as, as I explained earlier, in fact, the, the difference between the placebo and the people taking the drug can be accounted for by the fact that um, the drug is having some mind-altering effects. This, of course, indicates to people who are taking the drug and people who are assessing them that they're on the drug rather than the placebo, and so you are likely to get an amplified placebo effect in those studies. You're not completely comparing like with like. So. Some of the way that I think that drugs work in placebo control studies is by this amplified placebo effect. So if you're going to use drugs in a drug-centered manner, what, what do you need to know about them and how should they be used? First of all, you need to know the whole range of mental and physical effects that drugs cause. You need to know everything about the global state that they produce how they affect the body, how they affect the brain, and how that is manifested in feelings, in, in changes in feelings and behaviours. You need to know what they do in the short term, but you also need to do, know what they do in the long term, because that might not be the same. As the body gets used to a drug, it adapts, it changes, the effects of the drug change. And you need to know what happens when you withdraw the drug, if you ever intend to stop it or um, try, and, try and get off or reduce it. And so you need to know everything, all those things about the drug, but you also need to think about whether those effects are likely to be useful in a particular individual situation. And do they outweigh the negative aspects, the negative effects of taking that drug? And are there any better or safer alternatives to drug treatment? I think a really important thing is to realise that drugs can't do anything and everything. So this is just a random list of some um, effects that, that, that psychoactive, mind-altering drugs produce. Some of them produce euphoria, make people giddy and um, high. That's not the same thing as making people happy. So I think, I think it's really important to not to just equate the effects of drugs with with other experiences. Just think a bit about what the familiar drugs that are used in psychiatry are doing. And um, I'm sure you can probably tell me more about this than, than I can tell you. Um, what, what's interesting is that these early psychiatrists described what antipsychotic, well, the early antipsychotics like chlorpromazine were doing to people in a lot of detail. 
And what's interesting about that is that, that the interest that they had in how these drugs affected and altered and changed people has been lost. You won't find an account of how Zyprexa changes people in this sort of way in the modern literature at all, except what I've managed to publish. But they were, very, they were pretty honest about it, okay? Chlorpromazine makes people indifferent, delays their responses, decreases initiative and preoccupation without quite just sending to people to sleep like the barbiturates did. That's what they, they noticed. Denica went even further than this and he suggested that what the drugs were doing was replacing the psychosis or schizophrenia with a neurological syndrome, a neurological disease, which was pretty similar to Parkinson's disease. Um, if you push the dose up, you've got all the sort of frank symptoms of Parkinson's. People got, you know, very, very stiff and very slowed up. At lower doses, you just got primarily the mental symptoms, the mental slowing and the emotional flattening. And he said, this, you know, this is how they work. This is, this is what, we're, what we're intending to do. We're trying to make people a bit Parkinson-like. And that fits with what people say um, about the drug and people's, people's experiences of, certainly of the older antipsychotics. People describe them as making them feel stagnant and heavy and slow and emotionally dampened or emotionally empty. Some of the newer drugs are a little bit different. So I think olanzapine and clozapine are a little bit different. They still have this effect of inducing lethargy and emotional indifference, but um, this seems to be associated less with sort of physical rigidity and restriction and more with metabolic effect. So people get this real compulsion to, to eat. Um, and of course, this was, you know, this information was, was suppressed for a long time, but I think this quote sums it up nicely. I've never been able to eat as much as I did when I was on Zyprexa. I gained 40 pounds in no time, and my mind was in a constant fog of lethargy and indifference. I didn't care about anything, I just wanted to sit around and eat. I think that they can be useful when people are acutely psychotic, and certainly that's what people report, um, that they decrease the intensity of psychotic symptoms and the impact that those symptoms, the emotional impact and distress that those symptoms can cause, uh, as well as making people calmer and uh, sleep more. I think this quote really nicely sums up the dilemma that someone who is acutely psychotic and does find the drugs useful is in. Although I felt very well, I felt as if I had absolutely nothing to talk about. I kept wondering whatever it was that had been so interesting during most of my life that I had suddenly lost. But I was very much in contact with reality, and for that I was thankful. The, the trials, the studies of antipsychotics, sort of back up. I mean, there's lots and lots of problems with, us, with them, but they do sort of back up that the drugs are quite effective at reducing symptoms when someone is acutely unwell. I think there are more problems in long, with long-term studies. Um, lots, and, and that's partly because all the long-term studies have taken people who've been on medication for a long time, taken them off suddenly, um, and then compared those people with people who've stayed on their medication, and not taken account of the fact that if you take someone off a drug suddenly, all, there are all sorts of problems that that might cause, withdrawal effects, um, for example. Um, most, so most of those studies do show that if you take someone off antipsychotic medication, they are more likely to have a, risk, a, a relapse. Of uh, These are mostly studies with people with schizophrenia. But those studies, the longest of those studies about, is about two years. What happens after that is much less certain. And there's just been a very interesting study published by a group in, from the Netherlands. And they, um, they took people who'd had a first episode of psychosis and they randomized half of them to be gradually have their medication gradually gradually discontinued and they didn't get all of them off at all only about 20 percent of that group com completely discontinued their medication although another group got down another about 20 percent got down to pretty small amounts of medication and what they found at seven year follow-up is that that group of people who had come off their medication or tried to come off their medication were doing better than the people who'd stayed on it and the amount of relapses had evened out between the groups.
lots of adverse effects of antipsychotics that I'm sure you're probably aware of. Um, just a couple of things I want to say that I, I think don't come out strongly in the literature. Tardive dyskinesia, it's a neurological condition. It consists of, of, ab, of abnormal involuntary movements. That's what's highlighted, but actually there's quite a lot of evidence that there's some mental impairment associated with it as well. Um, there's been more evidence recently about reduced brain volume. I was talking to someone um, before I started about Peter Bregin's work. I read Peter Bregin's Toxic Psychiatry when it came out in the early 90s, and I thought, this is really interesting, but he's going too far. It just can't be true that the drugs cause you know, cause brain shrinkage and these large ventricles. He's just totally over the top. Recent evidence shows that he was almost certainly right. Um, the, there's, uh, there was a big trial in America that showed that haloperidol and olanzapine caused visible shrinkage of the brain within weeks. Um, there was a study on macaque monkeys that showed that both of those drugs caused um, the monkeys to have smaller brains. And there's been a long-term follow-up recently that, that shows the same thing. The more antipsychotics you're on, the more, brain, the more the brain diminishes in volume over time. So to not worry people, we don't necessarily know that those, those changes translate into any actual impairments or any functional difference at all. They're very small changes. Um, and you can get brain changes with alcohol, with dehydration, with all sorts of other things. Um, but the point is, in a way, that those changes were always blamed on schizophrenia. It was always said, look, people with schizophrenia have got smaller brains, different brains, larger brain cavities. In fact, it looks as if it was probably the treatment. So, they are drugs with a lot of nasty effects, and you have to be pretty confident that you need them to take them. That's, that's my view on them. And something that's been happening recently that I think we should very, be very worried about is this expansion of prescribing, which has partly been caused by the expansion of the concept of bipolar disorder. 20 years ago, bipolar disorder was called manic depression. It was recognised to be a very serious and pretty rare condition. As, as a junior doctor working in, in an um, inpatient mental health unit, you would only see a handful of people a year with this condition. Nowadays, you can go to your GP and get diagnosed with bipolar disorder if you've got a certain sort of GP um, for so the sort of symptoms that a few years ago would have been diagnosed as being depression and probably 10 years before that diagnosed as anxiety. And that has partly come about because of a very concerted campaign by the drug companies to expand the, um, the, the diagnosis of bipolar and the prescription of the drugs that are associated with it. Even though there's no evidence that antipsychotics or mood stabilizers or any other drug smooths out moods or does anything useful for um, variations in emotions. <laughs> They do dampen emotions, as we saw earlier, but normally in a rather sort of dampening and depressing way, not a normalising way. That antidepressants are really very little different from placebo. If you look at uh, if you look at all the literature, if you get hold of the unpublished studies, the difference is minimal. It's tiny, um, and it's probably, to my mind, accounted for by the fact that, as, as I was saying, if you're doing a placebo-controlled study with a mind alter against a mind-altering substance, you're not, that's not really a fair comparison. It's not blinded. People are going to know what they're taking. <coughs> that fits with the fact that, actually, the use of antidepressants hasn't really altered the outcome of depression, which is still pretty poor um, if you look at people who are receiving treatment for depression. So, it, for example, the large STAR-D study done in the United States, only 3% of the people in that study who were all treated with at least one, and many of them with numerous antidepressants, actually recovered and remained well over the year follow-up period. And lots of studies have shown that people who, with depression who take antidepressants don't do any better, in fact, usually do rather worse than people with depression who, do, who don't take them. What are antidepressants in terms of the sort of psychoactive and physical effects that they have? Tricyclic antidepressants are very similar drugs to chlorpromazine, so they're very sedative, um, 
and not very nice to take, cause um, slowing up of mental processes. And some of them have some of these um, neurological effects at higher doses. Newer antidepressants have much weaker psychoactive effects. So they don't actually make everyone feel that different. But they do have some psychoactive effects, and these are some of them. They seem to have this odd capacity, that drugs like the SSRIs and then the vaccine, which I looked at recently, of making people feel both a little bit lethargic and some people also feeling a bit sort of tense and hyper and irritable as well. And they also seem to definitely have this capacity to make people feel emotionally a bit numbed or distant. So as far as treating depression is concerned, there's really no evidence that any drug has, any, has the ability to reverse depression or to make people's mood any better. There are lots of drugs that can make you high temporarily, but that's not the same thing. There are drugs with psychoactive effects that can suppress emotions generally, but that's not the same thing. Um, people who are depressed are, are often quite anxious, agitated, can't sleep, and there are all sorts of sedative drugs that might be helpful for those problems. But essentially what I'm saying is what most people are being told these days, or for a long time have been told about antidepressants, is that you should take them because they will help normalise your serotonin levels. That is just not true. There's just no evidence to support that at all. What we should be telling people, we as doctors, GPs and psychiatrists, when we give people an antidepressant, is this. The drug affects the way that people think and feel, not just people with depression, but everyone. But actually, we don't really know how, because we haven't bothered to study it. It might dampen down your emotions, make you feel a bit groggy and drugged, it will almost certainly reduce your sex drive. Would you like to take it? <laughs> Just to sum up, this is why it's important. The disease-centred model, that idea that what the drugs are doing is rectifying a chemical imbalance, has an inbuilt assumption that using drugs is a good thing, that unless there's a good reason not to, you should take them. Because obviously, if there's something abnormal and the drug's going to put it right, you must be better off taking it. And I think that's why, you know, that those prescribing rates have gone up so much. The drug-centred model emphasises that drugs are drugs. They're things that alter the body, and in the case of psychiatric drugs, they alter the mind as well. Altering the body has risks, has consequences. So you've got to assume that, there is, that, that using a drug might be harmful. Having said this, I do want to say that I do think that some drugs can be useful for some people in some situations. I've just said, as I said earlier, I do think antipsychotics can be useful in people who are acutely psychotic to suppress the psychotic symptoms if there is no other way of, of achieving that. And that sometimes they can be useful long term in people who are beset by those symptoms long term. There isn't any evidence they do this by reversing an underlying imbalance or disease. There's almost certainly many, many people who are receiving these drugs without any benefit and with all the risks of harm that, that come along with them. And for, for many people, those harmful effects will outweigh the, any positive effects that they're getting from the drugs. Um, well, what I'm trying to say is I don't, think that, I don't think there is a drug out there that treats depression or, or that, that cures depression. Dr. Cameron, um, Jana, um, what would you say is, I mean, I've got my own views on this, which I might share in a moment, but to, what are your views about the aims of mainstream psychiatry these days? And what do you think the aims should be instead? Oh, <laughs> big question. Hi, Martin. Um, well, I, I think... Um, I think the aims are getting better. <laughs> I think it's. I, I think it has moved on a bit over the last 20 years since I've been working in it, um, to the extent that it is no longer just about you know treating a disease. Psychiatrists do have to acknowledge that actually they have to do what you want to make you feel better. 
you, the user, the service user. Um, and, and that wasn't really the case 20 years ago. So they should be listening. Um, I'm not saying that all of them are, but they should be. I just, you know, I'll share my view is that, um, I mean, basically, basically with people, people self-harmers, but self-harmers, uh, people who are not causing a problem to other people, uh, you know, yes, perhaps psychiatry can help those people, although I think there's better ways of help, better ways of helping them. But there's another group of people who, who are deemed to be anti-so antisocial or, or, you know, assault people, crim, you know, crim, criminality, and um, you know, if 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 when people are accused of antisocial behaviour or or criminal behaviour, if it can be pinned on them. Uh, that, that their behaviour is due to, quote, mental illness, then they're sucked into the system. And once they're sucked into the system, the, the, the aim of psychiatry then becomes to, to, uh, to sort of get, get them out, what's this, the, 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 the revolving door uh, obsession. There's this obsession, absolute total obsession with the revolving door. We've got to drug these people in such a way that we get them out of hospital in, a way, in a way that they never come back. And it's that, it's that obsession, Absolutely. that obsession. Yeah, yeah. How do we get rid of that obsession? Uh, well, it, well um, please, all write to the chief executive of your local trust, partly. Um, and write to the government and write to your MP because I completely I, I agree with you. I've written to the health minister and, and I, so far I haven't, the, I can't get any time out of them at all. They in, won't talk to me. In, in my local inpatient unit, um, you know, there's enormous pressure to get people out immediately. And as you rightly say, the only way that you're going to do that is to fill them full of drugs and enormous levels of drugs. And once you've done that and then they're out in the community, it's, it's very difficult then to get them off. You know, especially if they're still very unwell, which many of them still are. Um, so I, I completely agree with you. I think it's I, I think it's really terrible, and I think you know th there is just a complete denial that actually mental health problems they're not. It's not like an episode of pneumonia. You don't just get better in a couple of weeks. In fact, even pneumonia can go on a long time. You know, every all all these policymakers and politicians want to believe that that you know that illness is nice and short and contained and easily treatable. It's just not not like that, particularly uh, mental health problems. A strange one, this, this restlessness that, that people get, mental and physical, isn't it? And it's common with the older drugs, and all the depot injections are, are older drugs. And some of the newer ones are a bit better from that point of view, quetiapine and olanzapine, yeah. But, but they're not, yeah. olanzapine does pr produce it too sometimes. What I would say and what I do with my patients is try and reduce the dose very gradually. Um, without necessarily aiming to get off at all, but just trying to get onto a lower dose. It's always better to be on a lower dose than a higher dose. Some people won't even manage that, but most people, in my experience, can get onto a, a lower dose of, of things, and then all these side effects will be, you, you'll be much less at risk of all these side effects. Sometimes the drugs can be useful in some situations of crisis, um, but you know, then they need to be stopped. It's not just the doctors, people get frightened about stopping them too, you know, that, and that is why actually you have to be sure that you're doing the right thing when you start them, because it is difficult to come off for some people. But doctors aren't supportive enough, with, you know, don't, don't encourage people to stop enough or support people with it, so that's, that's really important. Just a word on, the, on opiates and painkillers, this is a massive problem in America. Um, now, and it's probably coming here, therefore, is the use of prescription opiate painkillers. Um, and uh, probably the drug industry is partly to blame, but I think also, you know, we, we have to acknowledge that people have sought out mind-altering substances. Um, you know, lots and lots of people took and wanted to take and therefore got hooked on barbiturates and Valium, and now it seems that you know, that part of that problem in America, at least, is, is the use of opiates. Um, very shameful to our profession, to the medical profession, that we have been so in the pocket of the pharmaceutical industry, and we have, undoubtedly. I think the profession is beginning to clean up its act, at least to some extent. Um, you know, journals, I can see someone shaking their head over there. <laughs> journals like the British Medical Journal have really been campaigning hard on this and um, have... Uh, you know, exposed a lot of um, drug industry sort of manipulation behind research and data and things and had campaigns against, um, you know, make, really make sure that everyone declares that if they've got any connections with, with industry. Um, and I think, you know, a few years ago, uh, may, maybe 10 years ago now or a bit, a bit later, um,
if you went to a, con a conference, a psychiatric conference, there were drug reps everywhere, there was um, paraphernalia everywhere, there were freebies, there were, they were taking you out for dinner, there was, you know, it was just ridiculous, totally over top, they were flying people all over the world. Um, nowadays, okay, sometimes they're not there at all, the Royal College of Psychiatrists have run a couple of conference with, conferences without them at all, or if they are there, they're in a room downstairs. Um, so it, it is better from that respect. Um, yeah. the, psycho, the people who do all the research on drugs don't seem to be at all interested in how they actually make people feel. In, in, you, know, there are, there are, you have to do some volunteer studies to, to get these studies licensed, but all they do is they, they check their um, you know, blood pressure and they check their heart rate. They don't ask the volunteers, you know, does it feel nice? Is it making you feel good? Are you... You know, are you able to read? Are you able to ride a bike? Are you, you know, able to do your normal things? Is it, or is it interfering with that? They don't do any of that sort of thing. It's because people have been so fixated with this idea that, that what the drugs are doing is, you know, um, reversing serotonin imbalances or dopamine imbalances. All that anyone's bothered to really look at for the um, antidepressants is the serotonin receptors, and all they've bothered to look at for the antipsychotics is the dopamine receptors. Or when there was a theory that it was maybe dopamine and serotonin, they looked at some of the serotonin receptors. Now there's a theory about glutamate, so they're looking at their effects on that system. But these, these drugs, antipsychotics in particular, affect everything, absolutely every system under the sun. And they have very strong effects on the noradrenaline system, which you know, is your arousal system. And no one's bothered to look at that in any detail at all. In the early days, a little bit of research on that, but then the dopamine theory takes hold and everyone forgets about it. So that's what I mean, there's just such a blind spot, I think, and it, we, the, the research community just isn't really looking at these drugs properly and un, wanting to understand them properly, and therefore, obviously, education is inadequate because the knowledge base is inadequate. Um, I think trends in suicide are very complex, very interesting, reflect all sorts of things about social and economic conditions, about our culture, about our religious affiliation, all, all sorts of things. Um, and then there's the whole issue about whether it's related to SSRIs. I think probably the evidence shows that, that it is. SSRIs are the antidepressants like Prozac and um, Siroxat, fluoxetine, paroxetine. Yeah. Um, and I think there's reasonable evidence now that especially in young people, they can make, they, they cause this sort of almost acophysia-like state where people get really agitated and um, sometimes can, can get suicidal. Okay. When people think the drugs are working, what they're saying is that we prefer you in this drugged, subdued state than, where, than, yeah. than how you were before you were on the drugs. Yeah. And, and that, maybe that's what's happening, that, that people are saying, you know, they're working, but actually it's not very nice for you.